Welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you in the fifth TeamNet Quantum Colloquium. Today we, we have a pleasure to host Andreas Yen from uh, Rennie Institute of Mathematics in Budapest. So uh, Andreas uh, is one of not so many people that actually work on quantum algorithms, which is like a difficult but very, import very important endeavor. Okay, Andreas did his uh, PhD in the uh, University uh, of Amsterdam in 2019. Then he moved for a couple of years to, uh, to Caltech when he was a postdoc. And now he's a Marie Curie Research Fellow in the uh, Rennie Institute. When it comes to, to work that Andreas has done, it's, it's really a lot and it's very impressive por portfolio. Let me just mention a, a few topics he was involved in. So, uh, uh, quantum SDP solvers, uh, Hamiltonian simulation, uh, quantum algorithms for uh, uh, recovery maps and pretty good measurements, the quantization of some quantum algorithms, and uh, last, I mean, last, okay, one more topic uh, is this uh, quantum signal processing framework that he co-developed. Yeah, and he'll be talking about it uh, today. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Andreas, and the the screen uh, is yours. Uh, thank you, Michal, for the nice introduction and the, and the invitation. So yeah, today I will, I will talk about uh, this, this uh, quantum signal processing and its uh, generalization, which we call quantum signal value transformation. And I would like to <clears throat> show you what this framework, where does this framework come from, what it can, how it looks like, and, and where can you apply it. Uh, hinting at like high unifies several other quantum algorithms. So for motivation, I thought that I would start with quantum walks <clears throat> because uh, I thought that you may be more familiar with that literature a little bit, but I, it is also historically, it's how it was developed and you can view actually this framework as a generalization of the quantum walk results in this discrete uh, setting, these Segedi quantum walks. But first, maybe a more close analogy between classical and quantum is the setting of the continuous time uh, quantum, uh, quantum or random walks. <clears throat> In that case, you have a graph with vertex, vertex at V and X at E uh, with some non-negative edge weights. And <clears throat> the Lapla, Laplacian of this uh, graph is defined as a uh, the weights on the off diagonal and uh, the sum of the weights, but minus for a given row or column, but put in the diagonal. <clears throat> so that's the Laplacian matrix. And uh, a continuous time classical walk is just some Markov chain on the, on the uh, distributions. So it's, it's, a, it's a random walk and it changes, it evolves the distribution that you have uh, on, on the vertices in a Markovian way. And it is a solution to this uh, differential equation that basically uh, the derivative of the change of the probability of seeing, uh, being at one vertex is uh, proportional to the, to the Laplacian times the current probability distribution. So the idea is that the weights uh, kind of denote the conductance of these edges and uh, they, they just conduct uh, some uh, unique amount of, of uh, probability mass over time uh, while proportional to their weight. And, and that's how you get uh, this equation. And if you solve this, then this linear uh, differential equation just gives rise to uh, the Markov uh, group, which is just the exponentiation of the Laplacian, and at time t, after time t, just uh, e to the t times l. And if you have some initial probability distribution at t zero, then just apply this uh, matrix exponent, uh, exponentiated matrix, and that's how you get the new probability distribution after time t. And people defined uh, analogously quantum walks where they just uh, said, okay, let's use the same matrix, but now let's uh, let us have quantum states instead of probability distributions. And in order to make things unitary, just change the equation like the Schrodinger equation and 
well, what you get, uh, if you solve that, just get basically uh, <clears throat> the Hamiltonian stimulation in, in a way. So people say that just simulating the Hamiltonian, which is the Laplacian of the graph, that would be uh, the, the quantum random, quantum walk, analogous to the classical one. Uh, <clears throat> and here is a very clear analogy, and then people use also this framework for, for uh, studying things and maybe get some intuition to the behavior of this quantum system from some graph theory notions. Uh, but today I would like to focus more actually on the, although we will come back to the Hamiltonian simulation, I would like to focus on more in discrete case. Uh, when you have discrete time steps <clears throat> and uh, a corresponding Markov chain transition matrix is just a square matrix where the VU element of this matrix will describe the probability of, of stepping to the vertex V if you are sitting at U at that time step. And uh, in a weighted graph, uh, this is just defined by uh, the weight of this particular edge divided by all the weights that uh, are, uh, all, all the edge weights that are adjacent to the vertex U. So it's, it's a very natural discrete analog of the of the uh, continuous time case. Uh, but now you have a discrete uh, time step Markov chain. <clears throat> and the question is, how can you quantize these uh, discrete updates? And uh, Sagadi suggested the following way that <clears throat> we should have some sort of coherent quantum analog of this uh, update or step operation where if we are at a vertex u, then we would like to be able to transition to the vertex v with probability p u v. And how to do this coherently? Well, you can just imagine that you have a register which is initially at zero, and you create a superposition over the new, new vertices v with the square roots of the probabilities. And then this will be an isometry this way, because uh, it's a unique Unique, uh, unit length vector, so it should be possible quantum mechanically to, to implement such an operation. And while this is clearly a, a quantum analog of the classical step, because if you would apply this operation, measure the first register and maybe forget the second one, then you would just implement one step of the Markov operator. So this is indeed uh, some class quantum analog of the classical process. The problem is that a Markov process should forget its past. So the problem here is that we kind of remember where we came from in this unitary picture. And that is in some way necessary because quantum mechanics is, is uh, reversible. So we can't really forget you directly. So in order to solve this issue, uh, Sagadi, uh, instead of erasing history, uh, suggested to use some sort of reflection operators for this purpose. So what uh, Mario Segari suggested <clears throat> is that we should have a walk operator which applies the update, swaps the two registers, and then applies the inverse of the update. This is sort of a reflection operator. And actually to get the full walk operator, um, also a reflection is, reflection is implemented, uh, reflecting to the initial, uh, the first, register being in the zero state. So <clears throat> remember that the update operator worked as we wanted to, it to work when the first register was set to zero and we had place, placeholder to write down the, uh, the names of the new vertices. So it kind of makes sense to, to do something with this initial state. And you can understand this as the swap operation uh, is again a reflection in a way, because uh, if you apply the swap twice, it's the identity operator, so it has plus minus one spectrum, and you just like uh, apply this uh, update operator in its inverse, so it still uh, remains a reflection operator, just in different bases. So you can understand this W operator as a product of two reflections, and Segedi analyzed it that way. But uh, I would like to like phrase a bit differently what's special about this operator and, and, and show you a direct connection to this uh, 
to this Markov chain matrix. <clears throat> and and here for the simplicity. Sorry, Andras, can I ask something? Yes, please. So uh, can you move back just one to the previous slide? Yeah. So uh, like when you define this unitary in the second equation, I, I mean it's uh, like taking a square root of the of the weights of the Markov uh, chain would give you a unitary, like if you have this auxiliary register. But in principle, you could have phases. I, I think, like, uh, does it? Uh, you know, you can perhaps like append uh, some phases that depend, okay, on v, v and U, right? Like, does it change the? In, in principle, there is such a freedom, right? I, I, I think. Uh, does yeah. it change uh, anything? That could change what's happening. And yeah, in the next slide, actually, I will explain what is the property that we really need. Like also, like you can see that this unitary, this update step, step is not fully specified. So if it's not a zero state in the first register, I don't say what to do. And it turns out to be irrelevant what is there. The phases are not irrelevant though. And uh, well, in, if, if, the, if there are some complex numbers, it will be just, give rise to a different uh, matrix ultimately, but I will get to that. So what okay. is the really important Thanks. feature of this update step? Yeah, so for uh, for now, let me assume that, that this is a symmetric Markov chain, meaning that PUV equals PVU. This is uh, this is the case when all the, all the uh, diagonal elements of the Laplacian would be the same. So all the edge, the total edge weights per vertex would be the same, then it's a symmetric one. It's not necessary for these algorithms to work, but it's much easier to explain what's happening. And you can generalize it to like any graph, basically, and essentially the same results hold. Uh, OK, so first, just let's take a look at this first reflection operator, the W prime. That was just the update, the swap, and the update inverse. <clears throat> and if you define this update operator as I described, then the top left corner of this W prime matrix will be just the Markov chain transition matrix P itself. And this is the property that will not necessarily hold if you have some random phases lying around. And the, I, I would like to uh, present the proof of it because it's just so simple. So imagine like we, we want to understand the, the top left corner. So that just means that in the first register, I put zeros, and that's the only part I care about, and put u and v in the second register to, to learn the uv matrix element of this top left block. <clears throat> and I just write out the definition of w prime, and I recognize that, okay, u applied to the zero v state, I know what is that. I just write it out that that should be the transition according to the Markov chain qualities. Similarly, uh, the zero u and u dagger, that should be just uh, the adjoint of this state preparation, uh, this, this like update step just for the uh, vertex u, starting from vertex u. And then there is this swap. And what does the swap do? It will just like swap the two registers on either side. Uh, so I have two things here, this u and, and the v uh, that I started with. So it means in particular after, after the swap, everything is killed, which is V prime should be V and U should be U prime. Otherwise, the inner type is just zero. And then only thing that like survives is this two term when V equals V prime, U equals U prime. And then you have the square root P U V and the square root P V U. Now, if it's a symmetric matrix, these two numbers are the same. So the square root of P U V times itself is just P U V. So this, this is where I use the symmetric assumption. And something similar happens for like general reversible Markov chains and general graphs, but it's more complicated. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's try to understand uh, this quantum walk, which is just repeating this product of two reflections k times. And that would be a k step quantum walk. And I claim that what's really happening is that uh, if I just look at the top left corner of this. Uh, kth power of the unitary, then the kth Chebyshev polynomial will be applied to the Markov chain matrix P. That's what's really happening. And here's just a reminder that the, the uh, kth Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind that, is, that can be defined as, it's, this is a polynomial of degree K, but can also be defined as 
cosine k times r cosine x. And importantly, these Chebyshev polynomials have this recurrence relation that the k plus one Chebyshev polynomial at x is just two x times the previous Chebyshev polynomial minus the two prior Chebyshev polynomial at the same point evaluated. And so this is a this is a recurrence relation that I want to use here, and I want to prove you that uh, indeed the k part of this uh, quantum walk, second walk operator is just the k Chebyshev polynomial, and this can be shown by just simply induction. So for t zero, that's just the that's just the constant one polynomial. So in matrix language, it's just identity matrix, <clears throat> and indeed. If I don't do any quantum walk steps, I just have the identity operator, so that's fine. If I have uh, one step of the operator, that just means that I have just uh, this W itself. Uh, well, then I already showed you that this is a block encoding of the matrix P. Block encoding meaning that the top left corner of this unitary is the matrix P. So I have for zero and one, I have the statement. And the recurrence relation uses the two prior values, so I can continue with induction using this recurrence relation. <clears throat> and I just uh, write out what is the k plus one power, look at, and I look at the top left corner of it. And uh, so there is a small trick here that, well, yeah, and, and the, remember the w prime was just one of the reflections and this other reflection around the zeros on the top uh, on the first register was the other reflection so i just write it out by definition the first equality is true that's how w is defined and now i kind of do a funny trick that well first of all i just like take the two, ter two terms apart and but well, the second term will be just uh, okay and, and and here i need to uh, recognize that that w to the power k so that starts with w prime in particular and w prime was a reflection so when i ap apply w prime here at the beginning that we just cancel so from the k step quantum walk after i take out this identity part that will be just the k minus one step so that's the last term here that's the k minus one Chebyshev polynomial <clears throat> and now i have this other term which is two times the zero zero uh, projection times identity and then well i this is just uh, i can just uh, take apart this bra and cat for the zero zero and what i get is that uh, it's basically a product of the top left corner of w prime and the k step wall and that is just 2p times the k chavisha polynomial so exactly as the recurrence relation wanted so it's it's really that simple to prove that uh, k iterations of this uh, Segedi quantum walk operator is just applying the k Chebyshev polynomial to the Markov chain transition matrix P. Okay, so the question is, it's nice that we can describe this in analytical form, but what is it useful for? And uh, <clears throat> Here is, uh, people used actually these uh, work operators for doing all sorts of linear algebra stuff by uh, combining these uh, quantum work operators, a case step of them with some linear combination of unitary trick. Uh, and that will be the following. So suppose I have a big unitary, uh, which conditioned on some ancilla uh, being in a state. K applies the kth power of this unitary. In this case, that will be the quantum work operator for us. And I have also a state preparation in this Q that prepares a superposition over, over these control indices. Now, the claim is that if I first apply this state preparation in then this complicated control unitary and, and undo the state preparation, then the new top left corner of this matrix will be just uh, the sum over the Q case and the kth power of the use. And, and in this Q case, these were just the thing where the square root of this was implemented in this state operation unitary. So, and in particular, because these states are normalized, it means that if all the Q case have like uh, sum up in absolute value to one, then I can take such linear combinations easily using just this very simple circuit. So <clears throat> I can take in particular polynomial decompose it in the Chebyshev basis 
and if the sum of the coefficients is one or at most one, then I can just uh, prepare that polynomial transformation of P, for example. Uh, yeah, and then that will apply some very complicated polynomial to an arbitrarily large matrix, so as, as large as the Hilbert space that I work with. And <clears throat> so there is a, in, in some sense, it's known that quantum walks are often quadratically uh, spreading faster than, than classical ones. And uh, now I can explain you kind of intuitively why this happens for secondary quantum walks by using this, uh, these two results. And so this is called quantum fast forwarding where we wanted to basically implement a quantum walk version, quantum walk operator or something like that for the P, for the T step uh, quantum walk. So I, in other words, I want a unitary matrix at the top left corner is just uh, the, the T power of this Markov chain transition matrix up to some small error maybe. And well, it turns out that I can do this with only square root of T repetitions of this quantum walk operator and times some, some like square root log one or epsilon factor. And the proof of that is actually fairly simple uh, because it's the polynomial, which is X with T that can be decomposed uh, as, a, as a sum of Chebyshev polynomials up to only like the, the square root T Chebyshev polynomial. And if I want the arrows to match what I want, I maybe need to go not only square root T, but square root T log one over epsilon. So that is the proof. And, and these uh, CKs will be at most one in absolute value in total. So that's a very simple proof of why kind of T step of a classical work can be in some sense simulated with only square root of the uh, steps or, or quantum operations. And, and this is some intuitive vision, reason for, for this quadratic speed up that we see. Uh, do you have some question? Uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask, um, like how, uh, okay, I, I see somehow like this quadratic speed up here, but like there is, uh, like in reality, there will be some cost when you want to move from, uh, when you want to actually implement this, uh, this unitary matrix that corresponds to the work. Like, uh, is it kind of, can one do it always efficiently given the description of the walk? Uh, yeah, like what's the status of that? Uh, not always. I think that there are some, some simple Markov chains where people think that it's not so easy to implement them, this unitary version. Like, uh, for example, if you want to have some uh, uniform random permutation, then you can quickly get one, I guess, just by randomly applying some transposition. It's very quickly converging somehow. And hmm, okay, I'm not sure. Actually, maybe the, the Markov chain is not so difficult to implement. Sure. And this is a kind of uh, for the worst case scenario somehow, because I like there are some. Uh, okay. I remember some time ago seeing some works that when you have some structure present in your classical walk, you can still fast forward some like approximately sometimes. I think like when under some sparsity assumptions or. Uh, yeah, I think I think even the classical fast forwarding is uh, often based on these. Chebyshev polynomials, it depends on how you can work with the quantum work. If, if you can just like, like in a Monte Carlo simulation, you can just perform the steps or when you can somehow explicitly describe them as a matrix. Yeah, there are various other scenarios where you can even classically uh, speed it up, but you know, there are ones where, that, where you clearly cannot speed up, but quantum you can. And I, I present a few examples. So indeed it can be a bit more demanding uh, task to implement the unitary as opposed to just the classical step. But yeah, it's it like you need to like go to the particular case to see which is the deviation. Thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> so here I just wanted to quickly show a few results about uh, what we know, how to apply these quantum walk search results. 
And uh, so they, these were studied a lot, especially in the context of finding some marked vertices in an unknown marked set. So the setting is that we have a graph with some Markov chain, we can do quantum walks or random walks in it, we want to find a marked element. And the heating time is the expected time to hit a, hit a marked vertex if you start from the stationary distribution. <clears throat> uh, and the stationary distribution in particular for symmetric uh, random walks is just uniform distribution. So that's also easy to prepare. In general, it would be just a, a we know the quantum state, which is the square root of the probabilities. So if you start from that state, then you can detect the presence of marked vertices in square root of the heating time, the expected classical heating time. But then that only tells you whether there is a vertex marred or not. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a very limited thing in that sense. And Segedi showed that this is possible. In some special cases, it also showed how to find it. And then later, um, this was improved to an algorithm which can also find the marked vertex, but in a different uh, running time, which can be as low as the square root of the heating time, but in some cases it's larger. And this is a square root delta epsilon, where delta was the eigenvalue gap of the Markov chain, and epsilon was the overlap with uh, between. Uh, so it is, it's the probability that something is marked at the beginning in the station distribution. So that is always an upper bound on the heating time. Uh, I mean, one of our delta epsilon is a, is a heat, upper bound on heating time and in the quality faster in that they could show, show this money in Ayakron and Shanta in 2006. And actually it was open for a long time. If you can find actually a mild vertex in general with a quality improvement. And this is something that was like really open for 15 years. And with this new formalism that I presented, we can actually, we could actually prove this up to some log factors with uh, Andy Sambainis, Stacey Jeffrey, and uh, Martin Skokainis uh, just a few years ago. And <clears throat> you might ask, OK, but what if I have a distribution which is not the station distribution? Maybe that's already hard to prepare. Uh, what can I do in that case? And then uh, Alexander Bellows has some nice result in, in this more general setting. And he showed how to detect mild vertices in square root of the commute time. That's not, not the heating time, but uh, the expected time to kind of walk away from your initial vertex, find a mild vertex, and then return. And, and somehow this commute time is natural in the quantum setting because you kind of have reverse operations. So you can't just really just get there. You kind of need to get back as well. It's just some, some handy argument why this is the natural quantity here. And this was also not known how to actually find marked elements with such complexity in general. And, and we could also solve that in a follow-up work uh, with similar techniques. OK, and, and here are a few uh, applications that maybe I will not go through them in details for the sake of, the sake of time. But uh, for example, the, element, the famous element distinctness algorithm of Andri Sambainis that, that finds a, a colliding pair if there exists one in, with only like n to the two third queries that actually is the first quantum walk, uh, second type quantum walk algorithm uh, result, but that it was just a specific example. And later, uh, Mario Segedi generalized this walk, and that is the walk that I present to you now. And this is really a tight bound and 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 beating you know, any, any sort of uh, uh, classical algorithm. So this is a particular case there. It gives you a genuine quantum speed up that you couldn't do with just the classical walks. <clears throat> and and this is, these are all examples that are walk on a specific graph called the Johnson graph, where the vertices are somehow associated to subsets of a large initial set and edges are between two, vert two subsets if they differ in only one element. So that's the graph. And, and uh, this is where you, and it's very natural for these problems. Element distinctness, triangle finding, matrix product verification, they all use this graph. OK. And uh, after this 
little bit of experience with these block encodings and matrices, I would like to show generalization of this uh, Sagari quantum walk framework. And uh, that will be the quantum single value transformation. So just to recap, a block encoding was a very efficient way to represent large matrices on a quantum computer <clears throat> in a way that we implement a unitary quantum circuit and the top left corner of it is the matrix that we want to deal with. And this matrix used to be just the Markov chain matrix, but it can be all sorts of other matrices in other applications. And this top left corner is just defined by some of the first ancillary qubits being zero in left and right. So it can even be rectangular matrix and so on. Uh, and the nice thing is that we can efficiently construct block encodings of, of various matrices. And for example, if the matrix itself is unitary, which is efficiently implementable, it's just a block encoding of itself. Well, it's maybe not the most interesting example, but as a building block, it will be useful. <clears throat> uh, then also a sparse matrix with efficiently computable elements can be nicely block encoded. This is, the, this is for example, describing the HH algorithm. And then there are some more recent works on like how a matrix that is stored in some clever data structure in a quantum memory can be implemented or more physics motivated uh, examples are when you have a density operator row that we can prepare a purification of. And using this purification, the ability to prepare the purification can actually get block encoding of the density operator itself directly. Or even more generally, if I have some POVM operator M that we can sample from in the sense that we can construct a random variable that's for any input state row, outputs say qubit one, uh, uh, sets a qubit to value one with uh, probability trace row M. Well, this is just basically saying that you can implement the POVM for any input state. Uh, then that circuit which does this can be turned into a block encoding of this POVM matrix M itself. <clears throat> so it's a fairly generic input model. Uh, various matrices can be natively put in this form. <clears throat> and the good thing is that once you have a block encoding of these various matrices, you can actually start doing operations on them. Uh, using this linear combination of unitaries that I already showed you, you can you can take like convex combinations of these matrices, for example. Also, if you have a block encoding of two matrix A and B, then you can easily implement a product of it. Basically, you just need to take the product of the two block encoding unitaries and, and be slightly careful not to have interference from other blocks. It can be avoided and then you can really just implement very quickly matrix product this way. <clears throat> and all these can be done with a hopefully not too difficult circuits, just really taking a few combinations, applying a few after each other. So really this matrix algebra in this block encoding is a very efficient on a quantum computer. That's why you want to do this. Uh, and well, I'm not sure I, I want to go through the details of this slide, but uh, here's just a quick idea how you implement a sparse matrix block encoding. <clears throat> it's very similar to what we have seen in the quantum wall case. Uh, given index i, you want to prepare some neighboring vertices, uh, some superposition over neighboring indices so that uh, k is also put into the other register. And then there is the square root of the matrix element and it somehow you need to be careful about uh, taking uh, conjugates that work out nicely. You also have some column preparation theory, which does similar thing, but then you don't conjugate. And it turns out that if you just apply the column preparing unitary and then the, uh, the row preparing unitary, but in reverse, then that will be just the block encoding of, uh, of the matrix A divided by the sparsity S. And really the computation is fairly straightforward, kind of similar to what we have seen for Markov chains. Okay, so hopefully now you are convinced that block encoding is a natural input model and 
actually it's, it encompasses many input models that were previously suggested for quantum algorithms, especially for linear algebra. Uh, and so now that we have the block encoding framework, we can take a deeper look and what kind of transformations can we do. As I showed you, we can basically like add matrices by this linear combination, and we can also take products of matrices, so in particular matrix powers. So you could in, in principle implement many various, uh, dif many dif different uh, uh, polynomial transformations. <clears throat> but an issue with that is that because you can take only complex combinations of this, of this uh, block encoding, so that's what we know natively, it would give rise to basically polynomials that have the sum of the coefficients is at most one or something. And that can be a very strong restriction, and we don't want that. Uh, and it turns out that you can also implement natively polynomial transformations that don't have this restriction on the uh, coefficients of the polynomial, but the only restriction is that these polynomials map the minus one one interval to the minus one one interval. And well, for simplicity, I describe now the odd case, or suppose that it's an odd polynomial, meaning that it's odd as a function, or just only the odd uh, powers have non zero coefficients. So if you have such a polynomial <clears throat> and you have a block encoding of an arbitrary matrix A, then this matrix obviously has a singular value decomposition because every matrix has one. Turns out that you can apply this polynomial to the singular values while keeping the singular value decomposition. And so you had block encoding of A and you get a block encoding of the transform matrix where the singular values are mapped with this polynomial. And if the degree of the polynomial was D, then you only need to apply D times this original block encoding entity. And <clears throat> so this is the actual quantum circuit where depending on which polynomial you want to apply, you need to choose an appropriate sequence of angles and apply that, that, that will be uh, just a parameter for some single qubit rotations. And, and you can efficiently compute these angles given any polynomial P. So this is the circuit. You have this repetitive structure where you have some, uh, the block encoding U, then you apply a Toffoli gate where how many qubit it acts on depends on like how many, uh, qubits have to be set to zero to get the top left corner block A that we care about. Then you have a single qubit rotation and a top folly, and now you apply the inverse of the block encoding and so on you repeat with always a different single qubit rotation on the first ancillary qubit. And well, <clears throat> it turns out that you also need to apply a Hadamard gate at the very beginning, at the very end of this special control uh, ancillary qubit. <clears throat> so the nice feature of, of this, that this, circuit is the entire circuit, like you can just read out the gate complexity of this by computing how many gates each of these things has. Uh, and really it works for any polynomial that is bounded and say odd, uh, and it only uses a single additional ancillary qubit. So it's very resource efficient in that sense as well. And similar results also work for even polynomials. Uh, and then later you can somehow combine even odd part if you wish but natively you can either do even or odd polynomials. Okay, and so now this was a little bit abstract maybe. So I tried to show you how it uh, actually implies or generalizes other well-known algorithms. So there is this problem of amplitude amplification where you can prepare a state, some psi good state, and you can either mark that it was the good part of the state, say with a zero qubit, but with only some success probability p, and with uh, probability one minus p, you don't succeed. Now the task would be to prepare this good part of the state. But classically, one thing that you could do is just prepare many times the state measure, and once you finally get this good label qubit in zero state, you say, okay, I was successful, then I prepare the psi good state in the second register, okay. We know that quantumly, like basically generalization of Rover search is amplitude amplification. 
you can do it more efficiently with only like roughly square root of t repetitions. But the problem is that if you don't know exactly what was the probability, then you can overshoot and maybe you actually don't find a good save, but you need to repeat this a few times and that's annoying. Now I show you how you can avoid this overshooting problem and, and just directly prepare the good part of the state. <clears throat> so now look at this uh, unitary matrix U. What do we know about it? We know that, well, if we start with the all zero states and then, and the first qubit is set to zero, then we succeeded. So it just means that this first half of the first column is the good state. So you can also think about it as a matrix. It's a matrix consisting of one column. And well, what is the, it has a, only uh, one, therefore it has only rank one and then and a single one zero single value, which happens to be just square root P, the square root of the success probability. Okay, so now I want to make this square root P to essentially one. And if I manage to do that, then I get a new unitary where basically if I just apply to the all zero state, then I get the good state with almost certainty. Uh, yes. And it turns out that in order to, to find a polynomial which does that transformation for you and also has this uh, uh, norm constraint that maps minus one, one to one, it's, it, you can find a polynomial of degree square root of p and like log one over epsilon where epsilon is the, is the desired uh, success probability. So you can apply to us that way. Um, so just uh, like I, I'm trying to understand. So is this polynomial that you're talking about now like a polynomial uh, interpolation of, uh, sorry, polynomial approximation to some higher uh, like Routing like taking square root like a root of some degree let's say because this is some naive way of uh, getting up this value of p let's say so basically you want a function so suppose that you have at least a lower bound so you know that your yeah. success probability is at least p yeah. but uh, you don't know exactly what value yeah. it is around p now then you want a function which is basically maps everything above p to one. Mm -hmm. That, that would be like a singular value. I don't know what, but it's at least square root p. So I want a function gotcha. which about square root p is constant one. Well, I won't be able to find such a polynomial because polynomial means I can't have infinite many roots, but I can achieve that it's like exponentially close to one at mm -hmm. above the threshold. Sure. Yeah. And that this is the degree that is required for such a polynomial. So now many of these algorithm analysis questions just boil down to polynomial approximation questions. Yeah. And now there is a generalization of this, <clears throat> which is easy to state in this framework. It's called the oblivious amplitude amplification. The problem in amplitude amplification that you need to reflect around the initial state and that can be expensive. If you want to do it in a row or chain, you don't want that. So, uh, here we have another version. Suppose that I have a unitary matrix U and I can only implement this unitary matrix probabilistically in the sense that uh, uh, maybe this matrix A is, okay, first I, Okay, maybe that's not the way, best way I want to say you. Okay. Mm. Okay, I, I, I say this as the motivation for this. So suppose that you have a unitary implementation <clears throat> where you can only implement unitary with some successful DP, but then you really applied the unitary with success for P and you signal that success. Now, uh, this means that you have a block encoding of a subnormalized unitary, but the unitary matrix have all eigenvalues, uh, a, a complex, unit, uh, complex root of infinity, 
In particular, all the singular values are just one. Now, if you implement a subnormalized version of the unitary, then all the single values leave the same value. Now you just apply your polynomial, like in this fixed point amplification version, and that will transform all these square root p uh, singular values to roughly one while preserving the single value decomposition. So it means that it will just basically amplify this unitary implementation to an almost perfect one. I had a unitary implementation that succeeded with some, some fixed probability, but smaller than one, and I transformed it to a unitary which is basically perfectly implemented. This is used in some Hamiltonian simulation papers, the important subroutine. Uh, we actually also use this for implementing these path recovery maps. We could only first implement somehow a subnormalized version of the recovery map. But because we were able to implement this uh, like unitary, we could just basically boost it to success probability one with only requiring a single copy of the state that we want to recover. So we can actually apply this channel to a single copy of it input state. We don't need to like require many copies and then like it's small, small success probability applied a lot of times. You can just boost this unitary implementation. <clears throat> and more generically, uh, what you can do is something called a singular vector transformation. So you have a block encoding of some matrix A. It has some left and right singular uh, vectors. And there is one task that also comes up in other uh, applications in various forms that you have a quantum state, which is a superposition of, say, right singular vectors of this matrix A. And I want to transform it to the same quantum state, but under the basis change that I map right singular vectors to left singular vectors. So I want to preserve the same amplitudes for different basis vectors, but I want to swap out right singular vectors to left singular vectors. This is what we call a single vector transformation. And that is a generalization of the oblivious and the amplification that was just this uh, like probabilistic unitary implementation, basically. And the complexity of this is if all the singular values that you care about are at least delta, then the polynomial degree must be something like one over delta times log one over epsilon. So again, <clears throat> uh, clean complexity statements. Uh, okay, and, and now quickly, I can derive you actually the HH algorithm in one slide, and actually a more general version of that using this framework. Um, so we just need to assume that we have a block encoding of the matrix A that we care about. Again, it will have some single value decomposition that is, uh, that is guaranteed. And an observation is that the zero inverse of A, which is the generalized inverse, in case A is inverse, so it will be just the inverse, otherwise it's something closest to it you can define, basically. Uh, that is just, uh, you need to reverse the order of the left and right singular vectors and invert the singular value. It's easy to see that it's kind of an inverse this way. And while well, that is great, because if we just take uh, a dagger as opposed to a, but it already reverses the order of the left and right singular vectors, but the single value remains the same. And clearly, if you have a block encoding of a, then running that circuit in reverse will be just a block encoding of a dagger. So basically, we get a block encoding of a dagger for free. And the only thing we need to change is actually we need to invert the single values to get to the pseudo inverse a plus. So that's a bit problematic because inverting uh, the single values means that I want to apply the function one over x to the single values, but that's not a bounded function, so I can't really find a bounded polynomial approximation. However, I have some promise that I have all the non-zero single values are lying somewhat further away from zero, so I have a band region here, then I can approximate uh, this one over x function very precisely the polynomial outside that small window. And I don't care what's happening in between because I have no single values there. So it's, it's irrelevant what's happening. And well, this region is that will be basically just one over the condition number of the matrix. So 
now just to state what we get from this result is that if you have a block encoding of the matrix A and we are promised that, that the pseudo inverse of A is at most kappa, note that this is a bit more general than saying that the condition number is kappa because it can still be a singular matrix. Zero single value is allowed, but the non-zero ones should be bounded. And just using this uh, quantum singular transformation, we can actually implement an epsilon approximation of the pseudo inverse matrix, but we need to normalize it because a block encoding is a part of a unitary matrix. Therefore, any such block encoded matrix can have norm at most one. It's, it's embedded into unitary matrix, so it cannot have norm larger than one. <clears throat> so I just need to normalize uh, this pseudo inverse so that I can actually fit it into unitary. And that I can implement, and the complexity will be something like kappa times log one or epsilon, just by computing the degree of such an approximating polynomial. And well, at the end, if, if one applies this block encoding to the input state, then basically inverse linear system, or that's like regression to the best possible uh, factor. And well, if, if, it, if I present it this way, then maybe I need to do some amplification at the very end. But then this is HHL algorithm, which is not slide. Uh, and here- oh, I wanted to ask, so no, so basically like, Everything is measured here uh, in terms of number of queries to the unitary. So, like, there are no like big overheads when it comes to like number of like number of extra qubits, like memory needed. For yeah, yeah. So I often have this question, and and so yeah, this is the circuit. So the block encoding is the block encoding that costs as much as it costs. That's given to you, and all the other thing is just here. So one additional and the qubit and the few gates per like application view. So really you should think about, I mean, I can't really think of cases when you have significantly less gates and what's necessary in between. So the query complexity will dominate the time complexity as well. Mm -hmm. So, but just generally in all those nice applications, are there some, let's say known upper bound? Uh, no, sorry, uh, like lower bound? Uh, blah, 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 uh, sorry, uh, lower bounds for the query complexity. And like, if so, like how this algorithm compares? Uh, yeah. Yes. So indeed for like amplita even ordinary amplita amplification has a lower bound of, that's a, that's a generalization of, of Gober search. Mm -hmm. Gober search is optimal. So this is also optimal. Uh, well, the only thing is like, I don't know, is the error dependence optimal? I think it is actually also optimal, but you know, up to the log one or epsilon factors, which I'm fairly certain should be most of the case optimal. After that, everything is optimal that I presented so far, basically. For this um, uh, HHL, we also know a lower bound of, of kappa, and you can get to that bound if you combine this uh, thing that I showed you. Somehow you need to balance out the cost of amplification and this block encoding, there is a bit of subtlety there, but if you use this stick, which is called variable time amplification, then you can get to the complexity. So yeah. And Thanks. yeah, one thing to note here that we can not only solve this like ordinary like matrix inversion problem, but also some, some other things like weighted and generalized least squares. So like more advanced regression things are possible in this form. Okay, and then Quickly, I want to say a few words about Hamiltonian simulation. So, yeah, if you have Hermitian matrices, then, uh, then this single value transformation is actually just uh, uh, coincides with the ordinary notion of eigenvalue transformation. So then it's really just applying this polynomial to the Hamiltonian or Hermitian matrix H. Uh, so yeah, single value transformation simplifies to eigenvalue transformations of the ordinary transformation for Hamishan matrices. Uh, yeah, and uh, I told you that I have, have some restriction on the parity that it should be either even or odd, but if I have a Hamishan matrix, then I can just easily combine the odd part. I just have any polynomial, I decompose it to even and odd part, and then combine them later with linear combination of unitaries, and that's how I remove the, the parity constraints for the polynomials. There is a, a, 
small thing that I lose. So if I want, if I do this process, it turns out that I am losing a factor of two in this boundedness. So if I have an arbitrary polynomial without any any uh, degree constraint, but it's bounded by minus half half, then I can implement it using this fix directly. And yeah, the factor of two is not very important in most of the cases, so we are happy with that. And the complexity is just same, apply d times this block encoding. Okay, and now this leads us to, uh, to Hamiltonian simulation. <clears throat> so in this case, again, we will assume that the Hamiltonian itself is presented to us in the form of a block encoding. So I have a unit matrix where the top left corner somehow contains this uh, Hamiltonian. And it and so Lo and Chuang wanted to solve this problem optimally, uh, where basically they wanted to have an algorithm for Hamiltonian simulation where the time and the precision dependence are somehow separated. So the complexity would be uh, time plus log one or epsilon. And this quantum signal processing was originally developed well, both for this fixed point template amplification problem and for this Hamiltonian simulation one. And indeed, just applying this framework. So now I'm quasi rephrasing the results in this QSVT framework. They basically just, uh, you can, we can get their uh, optimal Hamiltonian simulation result by just finding a, a polynomial approximation of this uh, single variate function into the ITX. And well, then, I, then just by looking at the approximation polynomial degree, it turns out that the degree suffices to have t plus log one or epsilon. And then I get an optimal Hamiltonian simulation result by just looking at this approximating polynomials for the exponential function. Yeah, so this is the proof sketch indeed that that uh, sine tx and cosine tx, the combination of that will give me uh, the exponential function e to the itx. And sine is a even fun a a pot function, cosine is even function, so I can actually directly implement those, combine them, and we are done. Okay. And okay, I just very quickly want to go through a few examples, and then, then that will be it, the talk. So, <clears throat> Uh, one application is to give sampling, where again we have some Hamiltonian, we want to prepare a state proportional to the uh, exponential of this matrix with some inverse temperature beta. <clears throat> and how the basic algorithm works, inspired by Poulin, Polan, and, and Wartian. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Can you actually help me out, Michal? I mean, okay, Wartian, perhaps. I, I'm not sure if he's Polish. I don't know. Is he Polish? Uh, yes, I think so. What's Jan? I think so. Yes. Okay. Then I actually pronounced his name correctly most of the time before I got intimated by Polish audience. Okay, so what's Jan? So they, they suggested the following argument uh, that uh, basically you want to start with a maximally mixed state and just apply the map e to the minus beta over 2h. Uh, and now that will just sandwich your uh, identity matrix by this. So you, you just get it with beta minus beta h in total. And well, actually, you can get a maximally mixed state, a purification of that by just preparing a maximally entangled state and amplify this. So here is a problem that for really large beta, that might have a very small success probability. <clears throat> uh, but well, you can, you can somewhat improve it, but still this exponential dependence in the worst case will be there in the Hilbert space dimension. So yeah, here are some, some details what to do, but I don't want to go into that now. <clears throat> I just want to have a graphical summary of these quantum singularity transformation applications. So if you have the function sine tx and cosine tx, combine them, you get Hamiltonian simulation just by approximating these either polynomials. Now, if you have approximating polynomials to this exponential decay function, then that you can use for preparing Gibbs states. And it turns out that 
under the hood of actually Grover search is basically just uh, it's also a special case of this the single right transformation or segregated quantum walk. So essentially, that's also just applying a Chebyshev polynomial to the amplitude. It turns out Grover search and identification and quantum walks are all just doing this Chebyshev polynomial, uh, Chebyshev polynomial application. And we can get improved versions of those by replacing these Chebyshev polynomials by something which approximates like a threshold function or something. <clears throat> But really, it's a direct generalization of these Grover search and quantum walk like techniques. Uh, and indeed, it is just uh, instead of going for these crazy oscillating functions that are natively there in like amplitude amplification of Grover search, you can just improve on them by using these approximate heavy side functions. <clears throat> okay, and here it's a final slide, my summary table just uh, summarizing what kind of speed ups you can represent by this uh, quantum singular transformation. And while there are exponential speed ups possible that rise from the dimensionality of the Hilbert space, which is, for example, captured by the Hamiltonian simulation applications. Uh, in, you can also get, compared to prior work, prior work uh, exponential improvements in terms of the error dependence. So going from polynomial error to logarithmic error dependence. And that's something which is like uh, presented in this like improved HHL algorithm that I presented. The original HHL algorithm had a polynomial dependence on the error, whereas using these approximation polynomials, you just naturally get log one over epsilon. There are also quadratic speedups that um, naturally arise from this framework. <clears throat> For example, stemming from the fact that the singular values in these matrices are just the square roots of the probabilities of the corresponding classical processes. And that is just the core of the Grover search speed up, for example. <clears throat> and also single values are easier to distinguish than probabilities. So that's like amplitude estimation can also put in this framework. And well, I didn't have time to elaborate more on this, but somehow for quantum walks, what really matters and classical and random walks, usually what drives the complexity is somehow the eigenvalue gap of the Markov chain. And that is the close to one singular values. And those are somehow more easy to uh, manipulate in this framework, like quadratically more flexible in some way. And, and in some sense, that is behind these quadratic speedups in quantum walks. And so these were just some more standard examples, but you can like uh, apply this in various subroutines and in various nesting, nested uh, ways, districts. And, and that gives rise to the state of the art SDT and LP solvers. Uh, you can also solve some sort of uh, quantum information theory type task using this uh, framework. And the nice thing is that you can kind of nature, uh, kind of uh, natively work with these matrices that arise in density operators and so on. And you can get nice speed ups by directly working this matrix version of the, of the operators. And that has the applications to distribution testing, fidelity estimation, best recovery channels, and so on. And while there are also some non commutative measurements that, that we kind of have to implement in the quantum law Stockholm framework, that also just turns out to be some sort of single value transformation. And then there are also other applications in like other machine learning type problems, like principal component analysis and regression, and, and many others. Uh, and with this, I would like to finish the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for a nice talk and exposition of uh, uh, yeah this, this whole beautiful framework. Uh, we have uh, time for questions and comments to the speaker now. Yeah. Please speak up if you want to ask something. Uh, yes. So, if I may ask, so. Is it now uh, how robust are those speed ups against like imperfections in implementation of, of, of the circuits that you showed? Uh, I didn't study this and I'm not sure if, you know, this error mitigation techniques easily to easily fit here. Uh, I think in some sense it should be actually sensitive to, to errors because somehow you can just 
implement a very different algorithm by just slightly tweaking these angles and this thing will give it a rotation gate. So somehow, you know, you get a very different type of algorithm if you just change slightly these different angles in this single qubit rotation on the ancillary qubit, and that should somehow very sensitively affect the entire circuit. So I would imagine that it's kind of sensitive to that. But on the other hand, it doesn't, it's kind of efficient. So maybe if you have like quadratically more terms, then it's like less, less sensitive to each of them. But since we are really efficiently using the qubits here, it's really sensitive to what you do on those. Uh, may, maybe there is a necessity in like, uh, I don't know, that may, may, maybe a good algorithm should be sensitive, but I'm not sure about this. This is just speculation. Okay, thanks. Any further questions or comments? Okay, I, I can ask something. So, uh, Right, uh, this bunch of things. Uh, well, like, uh, so, uh, so I, if I understand well, this is like not a nice, th this framework is uh, designed for fault tolerant quantum computers. Uh, and you expect uh, it will be prone to errors. But let's say for some meaningful applications, like what, uh, okay, <laughs> whatever that means, uh, like what would be like the size of the system when the, or those kind of routines would be, let's say, uh, I mean, size of the system and the depth of the circuit, uh, like, impl like implementing some, like this primitive, this primitive for some useful problem. Um, well, it's always difficult to, to like, <clears throat> find things that we can like run on small size quantum computers. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in some of these quantum chemistry applications, people looked at, uh, you know, what are the best methods for Hamiltonian simulation. And I think in quantum chemistry where you have kind of more complicated Hamiltonians, especially for larger molecules, then, then this is uh, one of the best methods. In condensed matter physics, where you have really nicely local, easy to describe uh, Hamiltonian terms, then there was a lot of recent attention to improving these structure type uh, error bounds and formulas. And I think probably for a while it will be more uh, useful to use them for smaller. So for, for, for condensed matter, you mean some Hamiltonian that act on lattices and there is some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, when you really have some nice geometry local Hamiltonians on the lattice, then I, I, I would expect that there maybe Trotter will be for a while very competitive, but for more complicated ones uh, like quantum chemistry, I would imagine that, that eventually this will take over. But, but that's really, that's not necessarily near term. Right. Yeah, on the, yeah. On the, on the other hand, uh, what, so one thing where, this could be applied maybe already kind of soonish that many algorithms uh, need to use some sort of phase estimation. And phase estimation circuit is kind of difficult because you need to have many ancillary qubits and then apply the Fourier transform and also, and, and so on. But to, what you really want is just, but what you can replace that with kind of like a binary search, like, okay, is my, is my phase bigger than this or larger than this? And then or, or, or something like, like these things. And ultimately just like want to apply projectors and see if, if, your, if your phases or eigenvalues lie in some, in some interval. And that you can do directly with some implementing some approximate like, like some rectangular functions approximately, and then just directly focus on the regime where you, where you now expect your eigenvalues and decide that. And then you only need to use a single ancillary qubit and do some rotations on that. But no need to do all these like fancy complicated control gene theories and uh, mm -hmm. these complicated uh, like many ancillary qubits and the entire Fourier transform. So all, all these kind of algorithms where you would like originally they were described using phase estimation, you can just use this and maybe iterate a few times 
and that will remove a lot of ancillary qubits and a lot of controls. The nice thing is that people don't always realize that actually in this framework, you, in most cases, you don't even need to use a control unitary. I mean, this block encoding that doesn't have to be controlled. Whereas for phase estimation, you have lots of controlled unitary applications that already is much more complicated. Here, just apply the unitary and it's inverse. You, the, the kind of this, this control unitary is replaced by just some Toffoli gates. That can be much more simple because that's just a well-defined gate than controlling everything in this complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so just uh, like, so, and your remark also concerns this recent improvement uh, on phase estimation that that uses randomization to some extent. Like random. So I, I think in QIP this year there was this this work when where some of those extra qubits were kind of removed because uh, yeah because of the usage of like classical randomness. Uh, maybe I'm like, not sure exactly. Okay, I would need to dig the paper because I, I think there was some paper that sort of uh, washed some washed away some of the quantumness and control needed from phase estimation, uh, on the expense of like classical, uh, you know, in, classical quantum interface, and randomized measurements. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure, but what I certainly true that there are many papers that prepare this kind of, I don't know, grand state preparation, this kind of task that realize that just like use this realization that and like estimated actual like gate and ancilla costs that basically just take some well-known approach, bit unit and like replace phase estimation with this like project projectors and just like add one ancilla qubit. And, and then I think there are several papers that, that are along these lines that showing that, okay, for this and this application, which may be not so far term, like may, maybe medium term, and that you really want to do this instead of uh, applying this complicated phase estimation. I'm not sure how it compares to this other one that you mentioned. I would need to look into this. Sure, sure. And just, okay, just like, a, just, okay, maybe there are some other comments or questions to, to Andras, sorry. I, uh, mm. Okay, just maybe one last question from my side. Uh, so do you think there is some room for interfacing this with, uh, with, with let's say, with, with classical computing in a sense of, you know, like, uh, okay, in, in, the sen in the similar sense that I was mentioning earlier, like when you have some random, you know, uh, you use classical randomness to sometimes like let's say run, run one circuit, sometimes other circuit, and then uh, kind of combining, you can combine things together, like in the in the in the post processing uh, level. Like, is there some room for something like this here? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question fully. So. No, okay, it's like a very general question, right? So there is this general paradigm of like interfacing quantum, like quantum resources with classical randomness, like classical shadows, related things, right? Uh, or like randomized com uh, comp uh, compilation and so on. Like sometimes put using the convex, uh, convex structure of quantum states uh, or like, yeah, can, can help like, I know, reduce the, the, the cost or uh, like make, can make uh, some protocols more feasible, let's say. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's conceivable. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I think, there are examples known and should be unknown examples of this type as well that uh, <clears throat> in some sense you want to like take uh, different observables and somehow combine them or some some states and combine them and then previous approaches were maybe somehow separately estimating them and adding the estimates and so on whereas here you can somehow quantumly combine the observables very simply and then 
and then estimate it directly and, and do these kind of tricks. And yeah, this, this found uses in various things. And yeah, it, it depends on like how much, how much depth, how much resources, like if you have, as you have more coherent computers, I think it's probably going to be almost always better to like do this matrix arithmetics actually in the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it depends on like coherence length and stuff when it really becomes actually practical. But, but many algorithms were like substantially improved by just realizing that, hey, actually it's much nicer to add stuff up quantumly and do the estimation in once than somehow estimating things separately, getting all sorts of errors and it add up my, badly. And then you need much more time in, uh, in general for that. Right, thanks. Okay, last chance to ask something to Andras. Okay, if there are no more uh, questions, let us thank the, the speaker again. Thanks, Andras, for joining us today. Uh, it was great to have you. Yeah, yeah thank you for the invitation and uh, hopefully uh, see you soon. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.